lot of people out there. It's just a name or a label. This place is as real as it gets. And the one thing every player knows, this ain't no game. You got something to say? Uh, Sit the fuck down and chill out. 45 talking to me, asking me to squeeze like people always bleed when they're looking at one of these. I'm a disciple of the streets. The most dangerous thing in this fucking world is money. This shit can make you live, but it can also make you die. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Congratulations, man, from humble beginnings, right? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, Let, very much so. Let's talk about this. So seasons one and two are being distributed by Lionsgate, one of the biggest distributors in the movie, in movies and television. You Correct. started this show just because you wanted to see what it would be like to, to make a show on your own. I mean, this, this, you know, you were doing this all by yourself at the beginning. Okay. Um. <laughs> Let me start off by saying this, right? Something that I always tell people is, I don't fear death, it's living mediocre that scares the crap out of me, okay? So all of my life, regardless of whatever I've been doing, I've always been trying to do something. I used to be a rapper, that didn't work out, as you know, but <laughs> then I tried clothing, I had a website, and one morning two years ago, I was laying in my bed and I'm like, what's the next thing that I have not tried? Oh, Excuse. you should try putting your phone yeah. on silent. I'm about to try that right now. Uh, there we go. There you go. And uh, I basically asked myself, what's the next thing that I have not tried? And uh, what came to my mind was a film. Mm -hmm. So originally, Money and Violence was supposed to be an hour and 45 minute long feature. But two months into shooting, I decided maybe it would be better for me to make this a series, being that I have no following and it will give me more of an opportunity to create one. To build a following Correct. per episode. You're at, I think, 22 million, 23 million Actually, views Actually, 59 point? million. 59 million, so yes. that, that is a massive jump from the uh, last article that I read. Very much so. So let's talk about what your skills were when you initially uh, started the show, when you're done texting. No, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm putting this on silent, actually, so that, there we go. Um, so you started this show. What were your skills? What had you done on a film set before? On a film set, absolutely nothing. I had never acted. Uh, the only thing I, ha I had done, I, I had done quite a bit of writing um, because I had written two novels, which I had never published. So let's talk about what you learned, or at least what you knew going into it. I'm going to throw a word out to you that for shooting a television show specifically, coverage. What did you know about getting coverage? Nothing. How did you figure that out as you went along? I guess it was raw talent. You know, what, what, what was amazing to me was the first day that I went out to shoot, I wrote these two scenes, and we went out, we shot the scenes. Now, I also edited the project, and before then I had never edited a day in my life. I learned how to edit off of YouTube tutorials. So when I took the footage back home, I had my desktop, and I had my laptop. The laptop was on YouTube. The desktop was on Adobe Premiere Pro CS6. And when I finally finished editing the first scene, what I had saw in my head was exactly what I saw on the screen. And I was like, oh my god, this is possible. And I just kept going from there. So you walked into shooting your first scene knowing that you were going to need to get you know, close-ups, master shot, all of those things? I shot the entire first season with one lens. So when you watch the entire first season, you'll see that I don't really have any wide shots whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Whatsoever, everything is pretty much close. It was later on, as I got further along in the season, that I started learning about establishing shots um, and shots like that. But the lens that I had didn't look very cinematic 
when it took wide shots, unless I used the depth of field. So I always had to use a pole or I had to use a tree or something um, to create depth of field. It's video a lot of the time. Video most of the time doesn't look that cinematic. Yes. With without any kind of depth of field, especially in a wide shot. Yeah, because it, it, it was a D, it was a DSLR camera. Right. So it wasn't you know it wasn't uh, anything too crazy. It wasn't a black magic or anything. It was just a Canon 5D Mark III. And I shot the entire first season, not only with one camera, but also with one mic. No lavaliers, no nothing. Just one um, Sennheiser boom mic. Wow. That's un and you, you created a following. I mean, these are things, uh, one Sennheiser boom mic is, a, is what people would say, you can't shoot a TV show like that. <laughs> do you feel that way? I mean, do you look back and say, and think to yourself, I did shoot a TV show that way, but I wish I hadn't? No, no. Um, I'm happy it happened exactly the way it did, only because I love the fact that aside from the storyline of the show, I think the backstory stands as a testament as to what's possible. For someone who never did film a day in his life, never stepped foot behind a camera, never edited, never directed, never did any of this, and then by the end of our first season, I get a phone call, I'm getting recognized by the Tribeca Film Festival as one of the directors that's making great strides on the digital platform. So it just showed me, you know, all of my life I've always heard, as long as you put your mind to it, it's possible, but this was really proof that that is true. Absolutely. What was the, let's talk about what the story was that you wanted, to, that you set out to tell right from the beginning. Okay. Um, I'm a strong believer in if you want to be better, you have to be different. So I thought back to everything I've ever seen on screen, everything urban, um, all of my life. And I just felt that I've never really seen the truth depicted on screen because the quote unquote bad guy, the, the quote unquote bad guy is always so villainized, you know. Um, I always say that every villain is someone's hero. And the reason being is because a lot of things are done out of necessity, but a lot of these characters are depicted as if they get, it, they get joy right. out of what they do, you know, when a lot of times it's cases of survival. So what I figured I'd do was I wanted to give the world a more candid look at a group of people that under normal circumstances they wouldn't get to know. Maybe under normal circumstances, they'd cross the street to avoid them. You know, because when you watch the news, you always see the what, but you never see the why. We get a lot of comparisons to um, HBO's The Wire. And I'm, I was flattered the first season because for us to have minimal production and to be compared to one of the greatest series that HBO ever had. I thought that was, that was amazing. It was very flattering. But the huge difference between our two shows is that The Wire, you had a group of men who were fighting for power. They were fighting for control of the drug trade in Baltimore, whereas on Money and Violence, you have a group of men who grow up in this neighborhood with limited resources, and they're just fighting for survival. So you look at The Wire as a show that was about essentially fighting for power. Were you trying to say something specifically about the neighborhood that, 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 that this took place? It, it, it wasn't even so much of trying to say something for, about the neighborhood. It was just trying to give the world a better understanding of a group of people, just so that, not to justify their acts, but just so that people can say, you know what, I don't agree with what they do, but I get it. Did you ever worry about... Uh, sort of depicting young black men in violent situations? I really didn't worry about that because that was not my intent. So therefore, even if my intent was misunderstood, that doesn't change what my intent was. It, right. It's just that it was misunderstood. It's one of those, it's, it's one of those like awful questions that, you know, the art before the actuality, which is and so, so often people see uh, movies about uh, crime-ridden neighborhoods, and young black men with guns, and they think, well, you're just sort of perpetuating a stereotype. Did you worry about that at all? No, not at all. And the reason being is, although the title is Money and Violence, there isn't that much violence on the show. Yeah. You know, it's more about deeper situations, but also as well, like even with the title, people said, why did I create this um, show and title it Money and Violence? I said, well, the truth is, 
that's kind of what capitalism is based on. I could have made a show about a Fortune 500 company and called it Money and Violence. I could have made a show about the insurance industry and called it Money and Violence. It just breaks down capitalism to the basics. Absolutely. Uh, I want to go back to filmmaking for a second and what it was like for you being a first-time filmmaker, making all of this content, a crazy amount of content for a first-time filmmaker. What was your biggest challenge on set? Oh, <laughs> my biggest challenge was being consistent. You have to keep in mind that the first season was 25 episodes, which spanned over seven months. Every week, I wrote a new episode. So each episode would air Tuesday night at 8, and then the next day I would have six days to write an entire episode, to shoot it, and to edit it and have it ready by the following Tuesday. Why was it so important for you to remain consistent like that? I mean, so often, especially when it comes to uh, stuff on the internet, it's not about a consistent time that it's put up. People watch it on their own time. I, I, I felt that it just worked in our favor. You know, being that we did have minimal production, what was under our control to be as professional as possible with, I wanted to make sure it was on point. Did it have to do with momentum at all, too? Like, you don't want to lose any momentum. You no, don't of want to course. keep going. Of course. You know, that played a part, but I wanted to create a habit with my audience because every Tuesday night at 8, you better believe that people were running home from work because they wanted to watch this. So I, I wanted to create that habit. You know, I wanted, I wanted something that, that, that they can depend on, that they know, okay, it's coming this day. You know, not let me, let me check... YouTube every day to see if it's coming. No, okay, we know it's Tuesday at eight. It's gonna be there. And now you cast a lot of your friends, right? Mm -hmm. What was it like working with your friends who had never acted before? How did you give them directions politely, nicely? <laughs> How did you take direction yourself politely, nicely? I mean, did you have anybody on set who was helping you sometimes when you were doing scenes and you couldn't really direct yourself? As far as directing is concerned, I really didn't have any help. You know, the funny thing is, before this project, I used to ask myself, what is, I don't get what the role of a director is. I don't get why a director is so important. But after this project, you know, I've learned that a director is probably one of the most important people on the set. And the reason being, especially for myself as not only the director, but also the one who wrote and created these characters, I had to teach my actors how to become these characters because, you know, they're all in my mind. No one knows these characters better than I do. How did you do that? Um, I did that a couple of different ways. For one, one of the most important things that was to me was whenever I had a new actor, I would tell them, listen, I understand what the storyline is, but I want you to get that this is not an opportunity to look gangster. This is an opportunity to tell a story, to try to make the world understand some of the people from our neighborhoods. You know, I remember uh, we were shooting this scene, and this guy owed this other guy some money, and he got his friend, and he wanted his friend to go kill the guy. So, Wait, is this within the scene, or is this behind the behind No, this is within the scene. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, this is within the scene. and. They're saying the dialogue, and he's like, all right, yeah, I'm going to go get him. Then he goes, and I'm like, what the hell was that? And he's like, no, you know, I just thought it, it would have been cool if, you know, I did the sign. And I just, and I'm like, no. I'm like, no. I'm, you know, because. Like, if you did that in real life, you'd be laughed out of the room. No it, one would think it, you were actually going to do anything. And it wasn't even just that. It was just. This is a life that's going to be taken. There's nothing funny about this. You know, this is serious. And that's the one thing that I never wanted to lose, the seriousness. Yes, okay, we're depicting murders, but this is serious. Like, there's nothing funny about this. You know, we're only depicting these events because it is the harsh reality of what goes on. But at the end of the day, it's not anything that we're taking lightly at all. You talk about learning about the role of the director. Uh, how would you define the director at this, at this point? How would you define yourself as a director? At this point, I would consider the director 
the person who holds the paintbrush that teaches everyone how to paint the picture that is evoked to the world through the film project. Did you have a light touch as a director, or were you? Would no. you say that you were heavy? I had was, a heavy role. Yeah, I was very hands on. Yeah. Very, 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 very hands on. Um, I was hands on with every single aspect of this project. You know, even with season two, where we had a bigger production crew, um, because you know we had a bigger budget. But I was, I still oversaw every single edit. Um, I still was on set every single day directing. I was, I'm very hands-on because this is, this is a project of passion, so it's not work for me. How did you go about casting your friends? Did you cast them based off of, okay, I know that you know, he's going to show up on Monday <laughs> to shoot, so you can be the co-star with me, or was it, I think you're, I'm going to write this for you, and I think you're, you're right for it? Well, for one... Or a little bit of both, really. <laughs> for one, my three, close, my three closest friends, I casted them as, as well as myself as the four main characters, and the reason being was because they're the closest people to me and they're who I, could, I trusted the most. I didn't want to put any random person as a main character because I didn't want to give anyone the power to be able to stop the project. So these three guys, I knew were gonna ride with me to the end. Um, everyone else, I pretty much casted, because every character I created, I had a picture of what they looked like in my head. So I casted my other friends just simply Whoever was closest in similarity as far as appearance-wise, I wouldn't even say as far as personality, but as far as appearance-wise, um, to the character. Now, I have to ask, every director has a moment, I think even the most seasoned of directors, Steven Spielberg, for lack of a better choice of a director to throw out there, has a moment on set in the middle of a shoot, you know, a shoot is 30 days or something, where he says to himself, oh my God, I don't know. I don't know the answer to this question. I'm just sort of making this up as I go along. Maybe I'm not actually a director. Maybe I shouldn't be here. Even the most seasoned of directors have those moments. You're in this situation where you've come up with this thing. You're doing this for the first time. How often do you find yourself feeling that way emotionally? All right, well, let me tell you that whenever- You're very confident right now. Yeah, well, no, I'm still not. <laughs> but when we had action scenes, they were never really scripted. I had the scene in my head as far as what was going to take place, but I didn't have a location, I didn't have anything. And I would literally, I remember uh, the season finale of season one. It was this really big scene where my character finally uh, bumps heads with the, the ne his nemesis the entire season. And we're driving to the location, and I have no idea how I'm going to do this. And I'm just like, oh, my God, am I really going to be able to pull this together? Like, how am I going to make this look believable? Because that was, my, that was always the most important thing to me. Being that we had such minimal production, I just felt that it was very important that everything looked believable. So with me, it was either as far as it looking believable, it being perfect, or I scrap it. And I remember driving to the location and just wondering, how am I going to put this together? But lo and behold, um, somehow, some way, I made it happen, and it came out exactly how I wanted it to. Awesome. Well, let's open it up to the audience for some questions. Who has a question? Hi, Moses. Hello. You spoke about humanizing villains, and I was wondering, who's your favorite villain? My favorite villain would be my character, Rafe. <laughs> but the reason the reason he's my vil he's my favorite villain is because he's such an enigma and he's so backwards because he's very seasoned. Um, he's a veteran of the streets. He's grown up in the streets all his life and he's gained so much wisdom. But he's so wise that it's like if this guy is so smart, why is he still doing what he's doing? So he's kind of like running in circles because just as wise as he is, he's just as lost. And I, I love watching him develop. And me, even me as the writer, not knowing where it's going to go with this character. Next question. Hey, um, I was just wondering, like, after, while you were filming or after you were uh, done filming, where, how did you learn 
uh, some more about filmmaking. Was it through your crew, or was it was it intuition? Were you like Googling like how to, you know, use uh, editing software or, or whatever? All the learning that I did uh, for the first season, I learned from YouTube tutorials and Google. So don't never underestimate the internet. It's an amazing resource. The second season, I had a production crew. It, it, the second season was totally different because it was no longer just me and my three friends that were um, shooting everything. Now I had an assistant director. I had a director of photography. Um, I had so many people on set, so I sat and I actually learned from them. Uh, next question. Hi, Moses, thank you for coming. Thank you. I'm a huge fan of the series. Um, I have two questions. My first question is, did you ever have anyone come up to you and say like, thank you so much because um, there's so many life learned lessons mm -hmm. that are throughout the whole, like almost every episode. So I was wondering if someone came up to you. And also, when is season three coming out? I'm waiting <laughs> for it. Like, I'm really waiting for it. Truthfully, I have people that come to me all the time. Um, I've had mothers contact me on social media and tell me, I, I had this one woman who contacted, who contacted me and told me that her son actually was killed by gun violence a couple of years back. and. She just said, you know, I wish that you came out with this show so long ago because I feel like if he had a chance or an opportunity to watch it, it might have saved his life. But I also do a lot of community outreach. I do a lot of speaking at high schools, detention centers, um, youth centers, and, and things like that. So, I mean, we're out here trying, to, trying our best, you know, not to only entertain, but to educate. I think it's time for... Season three? Oh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> have you started working on it at all? No, not as of yet, because uh, we're actually trying to lock a showrunner right now, because the third season is actually supposed to go to premium cable, so hopefully Great. you'll see us on HBO, Showtime, Stars, or maybe Netflix. And with that, do you feel like you're going to start writing the show before, like in a different way than you did before, rather than write Tuesday, Wednesday, shoot Friday, Saturday, <laughs> edit Sunday, release Tuesday, or are you going to kind of give yourself a little more space? I mean, I'm, I, I think I'm going to have to. But the reason that I liked writing it that way was because I loved being able to make the storyline relevant to whatever was going on in today. Because we touch on a lot of socially conscious issues as well. It allowed me to make the show feel like it was happening in real time. You know, we had the, uh, the West Indian Day Parade in Brooklyn, and we shot at the West Indian Day Parade on Monday, and it aired the next day on the episode on Tuesday. You know, so it, it allowed people to feel like the show was occurring in real time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one more question. Hey, Moses, thank you for being here. Um, thank you. Do you ever consider going out to another city for a future season? We had a lot of limitations because of the budget. <laughs> <laughs> so um, going to other cities is definitely something that I'd be open to. What would you do, uh, so if you take this to a premium uh, cable network and they ask you to sort of start from the beginning and recast, would you recast and sort of break that hard news to the guys that you've come up with and made the show with? I mean, I'm going to... The development process at a cable network definitely, is much different. Yeah. Definitely. I'm going to fight as much as I can for my day one people, no matter what. But I also want the show to be the best that it can be. And the greatest thing about me is the fact that I know that I don't know everything. You know, I'm... I'm, I'm as far as experience and as far as being knowledgeable, as far as film is concerned, I've just began on my journey. So for me to go to a cable network and be surrounded by people who have done this, you know, for 10, 20 years and have so much experience, I'm, I'm going to be open, you know, to um, whatever advice that they may have. But at the same time, I'm still going to fight as hard as I can for my actors. Absolutely. Moses, when can people, how can people see Money and Violence? You can watch season one and two. It has been released today on Digital HD, uh, on Amazon, on Amazon, Google Play, Sony, uh, Comcast, and on cable uh, on demand. Moses, thank you so much for being here, man. Congratulations. Thank you so much thank for you. having me.